Hello and welcome to whiskey.com where fine spirits meet. And you see the hills of Scotland, there are rain clouds. So am I back in the highlands? Actually, I'm not in the highlands. So you suppose I am in the lowlands? No, I'm not in the lowlands either. I'm here at the hill of Dumgoyne and that is exactly the border between the lowlands and the highlands. If you look south, you have a beautiful view to the city of Glasgow, one of the two big cities of Scotland. If you look behind me, you see the biggest sweet water lake of whole Britain, the Loch Lomond. Behind it are the Menteith Hills, and that is park, a part of a big national park. And what is re really beautiful here is that you have the West Highland Way just going through here. It starts off somewhere in Glasgow and leads you uh, along a 155 kilometers path. That's about 100 miles. And it leads you along the Loch Lomond, then along uh, the Ben Nevis and ends at Fort William. And about 13, millimeter, uh, 13 kilometers into this path, you come to the Glen Guin. That's the Valley of the Goose. And in the Valley of the Goose, you find the Glen Goyne distillery. And that's why we're here today. We want to see how the Glen Goyne whiskey is made. Now we're back in the valley and here you can see uh, the symbol of Glen Goyne. You have the two wild geese and that uh, comes with the name Glen Goyne as the Valley of the Geese. The distillery was founded in 1833 uh, by a farmer named George Connell and he didn't name the distillery outright Glen Goyne but he named it uh, Burnfoot Distillery. Later in 1861, it was renamed to Glen Guin, and in 1906, they uh, actually got it their final name, Glen Goyne. Um, it was sold in 1965 to Robertson and Baxter, and these guys really invested into the distillery. So they um, built new buildings and they built a new still, so they expanded from two stills to three pot stills and it was becoming larger. During that time it also became more famous and more well known throughout the world because uh, Queen Mom, Queen Elizabeth I, uh, was very fond of Glengoyne and she served the 10 year old to many of her um, uh, guests around the world and she actually gave the distillery a royal warrant at some point. So the Glen Goyne distillery was allowed to call itself Royal Glen Goyne. But Queen Mom died and five years after the death of a monarch you have to give back your royal warrant. So currently the distillery doesn't have a royal warrant and is not allowed to call itself Royal Glen Goyne. But it proves that they um, had a really really good spirit. Um, the last historical event was in 2003 when the distillery was sold to Ian McLeod for 7.2 million British pounds. Behind the distillery is a really, really beautiful place. You can hear the birds sing and everything is now here in spring in full bloom. Right next to me is a small burn that supplies the distillery with water. Actually, they're not allowed to use the water for their whiskey, but they're only allowed to use the water for cooling. And here you see the Kempsey Falls that reach eight kilometers in. And at the end of the Kamsi Falls, you have the Loch Karam, which is the water supply for the distillery. 
Loch Karam is a, a reservoir, a source that has volcanic rock um, above it. And that means the water has to run through the volcanic rock and gets filtered through that rock. And that means the water is becoming very, very soft and that adds to the fruity character of the Glengoin whiskey. Whiskey has only three ingredients. We already talked about the water and now we come to the barley. Barley is a kind of grain, but you can't really use grain to make whiskey. You can make grain whiskey, but we really want to have single malt whiskey. So what we do need to do is we need to malt the whiskey. First of all, you take two days of steeping and you just put it in your spring water and just wait for the grain to soak up the water. And then you spread it out on the malting floors and you use one of these rakes to turn it every four to six hours and the grain starts to grow. And when the grain starts to grow, it actually transfers the flour to sugar and that's that's why you do the malting process you want to have the sugar for the fermentation but you don't want to have uh, the sugar turn into cellulosis because the plant wants to grow and it needs cellulosis for that so you have to dry it you have to stop it and there is the the point in where you decide whether you want to have a smoky whiskey or whether you don't want to have a smoky whiskey Glengoin is traditionally a non-smoky whiskey so they use cold to dry their their malt and they used to do that at the distillery up until 1925 but after that they found out it's yeah it's more economical to get it from a big malting company they are now getting their malting uh, their malt from the malting company the simpsons and they use coal to dry their barley and that gives you a non-pt whiskey after you have the malt, we actually have to grind it down to, uh, to mash it. And here you see, this is the, the normal malt. It's uh, softer than the grain. And you put it in your malt mill. The malt mill is a bit bigger and it's downstairs. It's, it has roll, rolling pins. And then you grind it down like in a normal mill. And you get something what is called grist. And here you see the grist. And the grist has uh, three parts in it. It has uh, the husks, then you have the grits, and in the end you have flour. And the thing is, you really want to have your malt mill set up right, that you have these three ingredients in the right uh, amount. So what you do is, you take this box here, and it has thieves, sieves in it. So you put in your grist, and you shake it and then these th uh, sieves separate uh, all these three substances into their individual parts and then you weigh them and you can see what ratio you have. And what you then do is you adjust your malt mill to get the perfect ratio of 10% uh, husks, 20% um, yeah, husks, 70% grits and 10% flour. If you have too much flour, if you grind it down too fine, you will end up with a dough rather than the mash. So you really want to have a, a coarse grist. And with this coarse grist, um, you go on to the mash tun. The next thing you have to do with the grist is to have to wash out the sugars. And you do that in the mash tun. The mashing process is fairly simple. You take hot water and you wash out the sugars. It is a fairly new, modern mash tun. It is made of stainless steel and it has a copper lid. But as you can see, it is riveted. So it's maybe a few decades old. And um, the equipment inside is what we call a semi lauder ton. They take 3,900 kilograms of grist and mix it together with 15,000 liters of water. And then they just pour it in in a big splash. And it fills out the mesh ton pretty nicely. They wait for about two and a half hours and then all the sugars uh, are dissolved. All of the sugars, not all of the sugars. So they take out these 15,000 liters of water and 
then you go to the next mashing cycle. So during the next mashing cycle, they sprinkle on the water, so the water gets distributed much more evenly. And then they use 6,500 liters of water to wash out even more of the sugars. So um, they use 21,000 liters of water, they add them, but they only come out with 19,000 liters because they use 2,000 liters with the steeping of the grist. And in the end, there is a third uh, uh, mashing process where they add another bulk of water of 12,000 liters. And during these 12,000 liters, they have to use very, very high temperatures. And this water then contains so little sugar that they can't really use it during the fermentation process. But they actually store it in a separate tank and they use this water for the next run in the, of the first mashing process. So, let's move on to the fermentation. Glen Goyne has a philosophy of patience. They really don't want to rush or hurry anything. And this is really good represented by the fermentation process. They take 60 hours to ferment their wash. Usually, the distilleries take around 40 hours. Some of them are even faster than that. So um, a long fermentation duration, you usually uh, you cool down the, the, the wash to have a slower fermentation. But here at Glengoyne, they don't want to use the modern cooling process, but they want to do it the old traditional way of doing it without cooling. So what they do is they cool down the mash before it enters uh, the fermentation tank and that gives you a really, a really, really slow start. Usually the uh, mash is cooled down to about 24 degrees Celsius, um, but here at Glengoyne they cool it down to 18 degrees Celsius. So the, at the start, the yeast is not very reactive, we don't get a lot of bubbles, but it, it starts off later. When you look into it, you see that it is very cloudy. That's what they call the cloudy mash. So there are a lot of bubbles for forming at the end and you have to have these blades to knock down the foam so it doesn't boil over. They have six fermentation tanks with about 19,000 liters of mash in it and they come out with about 8.5% ABV which is fairly a standard um, range of ABV and when you smell it you realize it's very very fruity that's because of the long duration it's very very mild and that is actually because they are all made of Oregon pine Oregon pine is wood and there are bacteria lie uh, living in the wood and they are lactobacteria and they are giving out lactose acid which is the, the, the acid that you have in let's say yogurt and that makes the whole beer very, very mild and very fruity. And that's exactly what Glengoyne is looking for. And this goes off to the distillation process, which is the centerpiece of the distillery. So I'm here at the distillation room. In the end of the room, you can see the red wash still. It is filled with 13,000 liters of beer and then distilled. And as you see, it has a reflux boil. Here they call it a, a boiling pot. And this makes turbulences into the, the pot still. And these turbulences have uh, the effect that most of the, the stuff is actually condensing inside the, the wash still and then flowing back into the pot. And this increases the contact between the, uh, the vapor and the spirit inside the still with the copper and the copper has catalytic reactions and takes out the sharp parts of the spirit. Then the spirit is transferred into two spirit stills so that you don't have triple distillation with three stills but double distillations and um, this means you have 5,000 liters distributed evenly between these stills. And here is a little secret of the Glen Goyne distillery. It is one of the slowest distilling spirit stills 
in the, the market. Usually you have about 20 liters per still per minute and here they do it with five. So they're really, really slow. And this is what I told you about the philosophy of Glengoin. They do everything with patience. They're not hurrying, they're not rushing because good things need time. And the last thing why the spirit is so fresh and fruity is the cutting points. They have a very short uh, four shots, about five minutes. Then they have three hours of the hard piece and then they have the feints. And they set both of these points very early so they get more of the, the lighter alcohols, the lighter um, flavors and they don't get the, the darker flavors like the pepper, the leather, everything that it has these darker and more intense flavors they put into their feints and they don't end up in the whiskey. What happens after it is distilled, it is being pumped into the ground in the pipe and actually it goes from the highlands into the lowlands where they are being filled into the cask. Back in the lowlands again and yeah this is one of the warehouses which are located in the lowlands this is one of these old Dunwich warehouses heavy stone bricks stamped floors only the roof was yeah, also very old and a bit leaky so they replaced the roof and this here has really the perfect climate for maturing whiskey this region here in the east of Scotland is a bit more wet a bit more moist bit cooler so it's yeah, maturing a bit slower than the usual mainland whiskey but a bit faster than the island whiskies but what uh, Glengoin is really really yeah, fond of really find really important is the cask choice 90% of their casks are first fill sherry casks so there has only been sherry inside the cask before and to do that, you really need good ties to Spain. So they have ties that go back to 1964 and they get supplied from four different cooperages. And that is how they managed to get such a good stock of first fill bourbon uh, sherry casks. And yeah, the next thing is that they're really, really fond of being an unpeated whiskey. So what they do is that the other casks, the rejuvenated casks that come from the cooperages of Scotland, they really look for uh, at the casks where they have been before. They don't take any cask they had uh, whiskey in it that was already peated, so that might taint their whiskey. So they're really looking at where has the cask been before, and that's something that is really down to detail and down to the perfection they do here at Glengoyne. Yeah, and if you look around here at the warehouse, you find a few other casks as well. First of all, you can find one with a label of Edrington on it, the Edrington Group. Um, that was just because the Edrington bought the company that bought uh, Glengoyne. So Glengoyne had once been part of the Edrington Group. The other casks you're gonna find here are Rosebank casks. Rosebank was bought by Ian McLaren in 2017 and they are currently rebuilding the distillery and part of the rebuilding is demolishing the old warehouses. So they, the Ian McLeod, their mother company, was looking for trusty hands to give these casks to because they couldn't just yeah, destroy them. So they gave them to Glengoyne and now it's their their honorable duty to have these very, very old casks, 30 years and older, to be stored here on site. Yeah. Um, this was about it with the tour and of the production. And now we're gonna have an interview with Arthur, our tour guide who has provided us with all these informations. And we're gonna find out a bit more about the range of Glengoyne whiskey. So now I'm sitting down here and we have the whole product range and here is Arthur McFarley. Thank you very much for having me at the distillery. Not at all, it's a pleasure. Uh, 
I've, I've uh, talked to you about the whole day now, and so McFarley sounds a bit uh, Scottish. Are you here from the region, so how has your family come yeah. here? Yes, I, I live locally, but uh, the clan McFarlane um, originated on the, the west side of Loch Lomond, which as you know, you can nearly see Loch Lomond from the window here. So um, we, we, our uh, family came from round about Arachar on Loch Long, just at the back of Loch Lomond. And um, you'll have lots of McFarlands live <laughs> in the local area. Okay, uh, so you have like a really big clan family? Well, uh, we're not one of the biggest <laughs> clans, but um, like Glengoyne Whiskey, we're in the, the upper echelons of the uh, <laughs> clan society. How, how can I imagine that? Is, do you have like like meetings? Like, like, uh... No, no we, we, we don't have very, very many meetings as <laughs> such, um, but we, we do have in various areas. Um, you'll have the McFarlane clan pipe band of St Catharines and things like that. So there are lots of little uh, identity uh, latches for the, the clan McFarlane to come on to. There is also a branch of the clan up in Aberdeenshire as well. Nice. So, and um, we, we used to have contacts uh, up there also. So, but, yes, so when is it your turn to be chieftain? <laughs> <laughs> I think that may have passed me by. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've I've seen the whole distillery now, and uh, now I'm gonna try one of your products. So, ten year olds. What, what can you tell me about? What is the ten year old about? Well, the the, the ten year old Glengoyne whiskey is really one which is a beautiful whiskey to introduce somebody who really is looking for something which has got unique qualities in the whiskey. As always. Glengoyne whisky is very slowly, carefully distilled and what that produces are light, sweet, fruity flavours which are very reminiscent of green grasses, mm -hmm. green apples, pears, bananas. It's light and it's very, very fruity. And what we then do is mature that light, fruity spirit in 30% of Oloroso sherry casks and those Oloroso sherry casks are going to introduce dried fruit type flavours coming from the sherry that was absorbed into the wood mm -hmm. when the Spaniards filmed the barrels with Oloroso sherry for us. But you get little crystals which are formed in the wood coming in your aftertaste, mm -hmm. which gives you a hint of spiciness like cinnamon or cloves. And as it goes down, you get lovely vanilla flavours coming from, and it's a beautiful combination of this distilled spirits which we create in the distillery that you saw today and then the maturation bringing out a lovely combination of slightly heavier flavours and promoting the lighter flavours that we distill into the spirit. And I can tell from the expression on your face mm -hmm. that it's most enjoyable. Mm -hmm. mm. It's lovely. It's, it's beautifully mild yes and mm, it's it's warm soft got uh, a good amount of sweetness yes and also very flowery a little bit of grass and or hay or yes, herbs yes, or I, yeah, something green, like that green grasses green uh -huh. green stuff in there uh -huh. mm. um, i like it what, what about the vanilla does that come through for yeah it comes it comes through uh-huh mm. uh -huh. Not sure if it's yeah some some vanilla or some mm -hmm. sweets like yes, it reminds yes, me of like sweets like like toffee toffee caramel, toffee, caramel uh -huh. something something round something creamy yes yes like, like the yeah the toffee but, but hold it up against the the light mm -hmm. there and just look at the lovely golden color mm -hmm. coming from it. And that is the, the, the typical of Glen Goyne, um, to get mm -hmm. these really vibrant colours and it's lovely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, I've seen the, the slogan on your shirt, unhurried since 1866. That's so, 1833. Uh, 1833, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
how, how does that manifest? <laughs> I've seen some of the production times are a bit lower, slower. And yes, well, how that comes about is that if, if I take you back to 1869, mm -hmm. that was when Cochrane Cartwright was appointed the distillery manager here. Mm -hmm. And although Glengoyne Spirit was always slowly created, mm -hmm. he reduced the distillation rate even further. Oh. So that we, today, we still distill our spirit at a rate of only five litres from each of our two spirit stills every minute. Mm -hmm. And what that slow, careful distillation does is it allows the copper lots of contact with the acids and sugars in your, uh, your low wine that goes through and it brings out all those lovely, light, fruity flavours. And you've identified the, the ones which really make it uh, nice, like green grasses, and you've got all those light mm. bananas and pears, that general light fruity character. It typifies Glengoyne mm -hmm. to, in, in a really nice way, bringing those lovely flavours, matching them with the cask flavours coming from Spain with all the, the dried fruit flavours and highlighting the beauty of the, the construction that we put into that. So how, how is that uh, affecting the, the staff? Yeah. Are, you, are you all a bit more we're, laid back? Or? We're, we're, we're all unhurried, especially me. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but, uh, but what it does is it's, um, it, it, it's a philosophy which means that um, it's not just the hurry, it's the care. Mm -hmm. and the lovingness that you put into it. And we depend very much on the skills of our stillsmen and mashmen uh, to be able to create those lovely light fruity flavours. Mm -hmm. And they've got to be patient and careful to do it. Remember, we distill it at the slowest rate in the whole of the Scotch whisky industry. And that really is very, very important for mm -hmm. playing going whisky. Okay, so... Um we have the next one, the 12 year old. What's in there? What's, what's special about the 12 year old? The, the 12 year old be it becomes quite uh, something slightly different in as much as you have the 10 year old where you have the spirit that we create from the stills and you have some sherry casks and that's a, a simple combination coming together and mm -hmm. it's, it's very pure in the flavours that we get from it. When we produce the 12-year-old playing going whiskey, what we do there is introduce 20% bourbon whiskey barrels. Mm -hmm. And we then have 20% Oloroso sherry barrels, and we have 60% refill barrels being mm -hmm. used to mature the 12-year-old. The bourbon whiskey barrels coming from that industry in the United States is going to give us sharp, flavours that are reminiscent of citrus fruits mm -hmm. and you'll get hints of summer fruits like melon, pineapple, coconut, vanilla and honey coming from that white American oak wood. And mm -hmm. remember it's grown on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. So mm -hmm. the climatic conditions are different to what they are in Spain. Mm -hmm. So the bourbon whiskey cat flavours are going to introduce those lighter citrusy flavours and the wood is much denser and much more compact. So it doesn't absorb so much of the spirit into it and it interacts through more of the charcoal layer on the inside of the bourbon whiskey barrels and you really get some beautiful balanced flavours coming. And when you think you have white American oak, you have red Spanish oak, you have sherry, you have bourbon whiskey, and your refill cask will introduce a Scotch whisky colour mm -hmm. and flavour to it. So it becomes very complex and it makes it, uh, some say, a little bit more interesting mm -hmm. to have another flavour combination coming into it and bringing more of a balance mm -hmm. to the, the, the whole level that we're, mm -hmm. we're using there. Mm -hmm. I like it. I thought mm, if you introduce first fill bourbons, mm, it would be much more sweeter, but it's, as you said, you have that fresh fruitiness in there, yes. a bit of a <coughs> yeah, pears note, a bit of a fresh apple note I would yes, say. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, you, 
how, how much sherry is in there? Is there still some? There's, you there's twenty percent bourbon uh, uh, sherry cast. Yeah. You, you do there. feel them as well when you when you swallow it. You do realize, okay. Yes. That's, a bit that's of when you get the little mm -hmm. hint of spiciness coming from the, the spiciness. The the, also, yes. the bit bit of a what's the the mm. a bit of the darker notes, bit of the tannins, bit yes, of the, yes, bit of the, yes. the European wood. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's, it's a nice balanced whiskey, I have to say. It's it's lovely. It mm -hmm. really is. It's um, the, yeah. mm -hmm. and we're, we're very fortunate. Um, it's been well recognised in various whiskey competitions uh, around the world, particularly San Francisco, mm -hmm. where it was given double uh, gold medal mm -hmm. uh, oh, nice. award. And incidentally, in the ten-year-old just um, last month, April mm -hmm. 2019. We were gold medal awarded for the ten-year-old in San Francisco. No, I'm very proud of these whiskies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I would be as well. It's it's, yeah. it's a fine whiskey. So I've I've had a bit of a dig through the the history at the beginning of my video. Um, you've been bought and sold pretty often. I mean, 1833. It's a bit long time since then. Yes, yes. So how how did the the, the buying and selling? How did the heritage affect the distillery? Well, the, what, it, what had happened was that uh, in the early 1800s, the, this distillery, the, mm -hmm. the burn foot of mm -hmm. Glen Gwynn, um, grew to be the, the, the biggest... Of the, there used to be something like 18 small distilleries in mm -hmm. the, the valley here, and the burn foot of Glen Gwynn became the biggest of those mm -hmm. and they, they then collared all of the water and the production to go with it. By 1865, um, the, uh, sorry, 1867, the, uh, the, you had the Lang brothers mm -hmm. came in and bought the distillery from the farmer mm -hmm. and they began to use it to make um, blended Scotch whiskies because Lang Brothers were wine importers mm -hmm. and at the same time the distillery manager Cochrane Cartwright discovered that sherry casks coming from Spain mm -hmm. which were being imported by Lang Brothers mm -hmm. introduced the sherry input to the Glengoyne spirit. Mm -hmm. So from 1869 we used sherry casks mm -hmm. as being the main flavouring for the maturation of Glengoyne mm -hmm. spirit. And then in 18, uh, 1967 mm -hmm. we were sold to a, a, a company called Robertson and Baxter mm -hmm. who were buying other distilleries at the time and they grew to be Edrington. Mm -hmm. okay. The makers of the famous Grouse, the Macallan, mm -hmm. Patty Sark, Highland Park whiskies, mm -hmm. very well respected whiskies. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> we were part of that group until 2003 mm -hmm. when we were bought by uh, Ian McLeod Distillers. Okay. Now, when we were part of Edrington, you would very seldom see Glen Goyne as a single malt whisky for sale in the shops because, as a, as a rule, Glen Goyne Spirit went to the famous Grouse or Cutty Sark to be part of the flavourings for those two blended Scotch whiskies. Mm -hmm. But when Ian McLeod bought this distillery, they then put a focus on the Glengoyne brand mm -hmm. and developed the Glengoyne brand to mm -hmm. such a, a point where we now <coughs> have the vast majority of everything we produce goes into a Glengoyne bottle. Nice. We're delighted to say they have developed the Glengoyne brand in such a way that it's become much more prominent in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So um, I've heard different names. Uh, Robert and, what was it Baxter? Robertson Baxter. Robertson Baxter. Were they using English man or <laughs> Scotch man? No, no, no. They, they were uh, Scottish. So you, and Lang Brothers were Scottish. And so the farmer was Scottish. I've not heard any Indian or South African. And no, you? no, that we leave that to the other whiskey, <laughs> whiskey distilleries. So, Glen Goyne, since 1833, has been totally owned by Scottish, fully owned Scottish. So, companies. you're one of the distilleries who is. Right since a way back. The one true Scotsman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, we're, we're very proud of that fact uh, also. That's very nice uh, to know that there is a distillery that is just all yes. the way Scottish. Uh, 
because <laughs> in Scotland today, the last count was 124 mm -hmm. single malt whisky distilleries, and only approximately 30 of these are fully today in Scottish ownership. Mm -hmm. So we're proud of the fact that we're a real <laughs> extra shortage of whisky. <laughs> okay, nice. So, uh, the last one of, of the bunch here, the, the 18 year old. Hmm, 18 years? Is it, is it a heavy, heavy sherry one? Or? It's, it's more, there's more sherry flavour in the 18 year old Glengoyne whisky than either of the two Ooh. whiskies you've tasted up to. You will get those lovely dried fruit sherry type mm. notes coming and from the aromas coming and dark chocolate coming from it. Now, that comes from the tannins, mm -hmm. which will come from uh, 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 an oloroso sherry cask, particularly if it's made of red Spanish oak. And the, the barrels that we use to mature the 18-year-old Glengoyne whiskey, 35% of those barrels are red Spanish oak. Mm -hmm. So that means that the wood's very porous, allows lots of the sherry to be absorbed into the wood, and it's full of tannins. So the sherry takes some of the tannins out from the wood, but it leaves enough tannins mm. in that wood to be able to give you a, 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 an aftertaste, which is like dry chocolate. And there are little crystals form in the wood when the trees are growing. And when those trees are, uh, the, the wood's toasted to make up the barrels, then those little crystals form flavours that are like cinnamon or cloves. Mm -hmm. So you get that hint of spiciness coming from the aftertaste. You have the tannins giving you the dark chocolate aftertaste. You've got the dried fruit flavour mm -hmm. and all the beautiful colour mm -hmm. coming from the, from the wood. And the sherry that was in that wood Ooh. before. It's intense. <laughs> of course it is. It's yes. intense sherry. Yeah. But it is mm. it, it's a, a beautifully very, balanced. Very whiskey. round, very, oh, I have it's to say, oily and oh, not, yes. a little bit of nuttiness yes. in there, a lot of chocolate. Yes. Mm. And as you said, the dried fruits, raisins. Figs, prunes, figs, you've got all of that kind of, sort of dried wow. fruit type I like one. flavor coming mm, that's in. That's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> favorite that, that is awesome. That's just a, I'm a glad to say awesome. it's also a lot of other people's <laughs> favorite as well. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very popular whiskey. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I can tell you that for the second time in the last five years, this one has been awarded double gold medals in the San Francisco World Spirit Championships just last month. Nice. So that was 2014. Yeah, 2019. we've seen also a, a high demand as we sell the whiskey. We're seeing a high demand in in Glengoyne whiskey. Um, yes. Have you ever? You have a million liters of raw spirit production. Have you ever thought about expanding? Because I think it's not gonna. The demand is not going to fall. I think we're going to be in, still in high demand. I, I, I hope you're right. <laughs> I, I hope you're right. Um, in terms of expansion, yes, I, 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 that's something which has been to the forefront of mm -hmm. where Ian McLeod has been. With it. There is a little bit of scope for us to produce. We can go up to about 1.2 million mm -hmm. litres of spirit every year. Mm -hmm. But if we go really flat out. <clears throat> but you, the, the part of the problem that we have here is that the the, route, the land round about us um, doesn't allow us to be able to expand mm -hmm. easily. And as we talked about during the, the production process, we're distilling at a very slow rate from each of those mm -hmm. stills down there. So if we move the rate at which we distill our spirit, mm -hmm. then we will change all of the flavours. Yeah, I'm sure you don't want to do that. Like. <laughs> and if, if we do that, no. you know, people like yourself who know what you're talking about with whiskey are going to say, here, yeah, what are you up to? <laughs> well, you know, and, and you will know yeah. that Glen Goyne are turning yeah. on the, the, the tap. So it's, it makes it very, very difficult for us. Mm -hmm. And there are other things which make it difficult for us. First of all, there's... <clears throat> And then we've stated that we will we've tried to hold always to an age declaration on the bottle. 
No, oh, okay, that is nice to know. That's uh, that's a stated objective. And you're going to keep up with the the uncovered as well. <laughs> the well, the, from the point of view of adding colour mm -hmm. to it, that is also something which the, we are determined mm -hmm. uh, not to get drawn into mm -hmm. in adding in liquid caramel to give the whiskey any colour. That's nice. This, to hear. this is going to be natural colours coming from the wood. And that makes it difficult for our guys because when they do a bottling, oh, they've yeah. got to keep the flavours consistent and and the colours consistent mm -hmm. to keep the quality of Glengoyne whisky consistent. And the only way they can do it is by adding in older whiskies. Mm -hmm. We can't add in younger whiskies. If you add in a younger whiskey, you have, you have to change the age statement. <laughs> correct. Correct. Yeah, it's so tough to to. I think the blending process is really, really tough. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. To 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 but get the colors right, to get the ABVs right. Exactly. And the flavors. It's, it's just oh my god. It's it's, it's tough to ah. manage. And and if you have a customership of of so many many customers that yes, yes. You, you always have gonna have somebody who has a bottle of the old one and is gonna oh, like this one is it, different yeah. <laughs> um, yes I, yeah, I know but um, it's it's one of the but the, it's it's a natural product we start off with the, the intention mm -hmm. to hold to these values mm -hmm. which have stood playing going in, in good stead over mm -hmm. the years and now as the popularity but mm -hmm. going grows, then the the reason that we have that little bit of spare mm -hmm. uh, extra capacity that we can grow to is the the fact that we we do have this sort of three or four hundred thousand uh, liters mm -hmm. of spirit which we may be able to produce mm -hmm. over the piece, and it also means that we rely less on sending spirit to blended scotch whiskies. Oh sure, you could and put more that. to the <laughs> get, put more to the Glen Goyne Definitely. Spirit. Because where with Edrington it was a very high level mm -hmm. of uh, involvement in the blended scotch whiskies, Ian McLeod have successfully managed that down so that the position has been reversed. Mm -hmm. And we still have to supply for some of the Ian McLeod blended scotch whiskies, mm -hmm. but hopefully we're still able to trim that back mm -hmm. and we, we can make do with others okay. as yeah. we go along. I hope that the, the brand and the, the whiskey is going to stay the same and we're going to have we're gonna have enough supply <laughs> for the demand. I'm sure, by. sure that will be be the case. Um, but you can rest assured, it'll always be the high quality mm -hmm. that you recognise <laughs> as being a Glengoyne whisky, okay. and that becomes very, very important for us. Okay, so yeah, thank you very so, much for for having us. Thank you much for showing it around, uh, giving us the time and and place here. Not at all, it's been a great pleasure yeah. and I hope you've enjoyed your visit with us um, yeah, today. <laughs> we, we, we've seen a few very, of the various aspects of mm -hmm. how we go about our business here mm -hmm. and, and you, you go away knowing that it's done very carefully, Definitely. very, very uh, lovingly in lots of ways and that's great. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, yeah. Enjoying your visit. Thank you very much for watching this video. Um, if you found this video interesting, then please feel free to share it with your friends and see you next time.